Welcome to the show. I'm James. I'm Dave. I'm Riley. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're discussing Nightmare Alley, the 2021 one, not the 1940s one. Uh, we'll laugh. We'll argue. We might get a little too into it, but at the end of the day, they're just movies, Riley. Spoiler alert! That's what. I, that's my point. They're just movies. We're the show that recently received a one-star review because it criticized Jaws for having little character development. Well, you know what? A, <laughs> I wasn't on that episode, and B, dude named Michael Loves Tech called us the best podcast ever, so there's that. You wow. Know? And which one? The, who's the, more right? The good and the bad. I was getting lumped in with those. I said positive things. Well, one person. It doesn't matter because the guy deleted <laughs> us. I guess. <laughs> See you later. Five star reviews. That's the, what we need. More of them. Bad. Next week we're doing the Batman, Ooh. the Robert Pattinson one, the new one. But today it's Nightmare Alley all day. David, what are you giving this movie out of ten? At least an actual nightmare wouldn't be as much of a snooze. Five point seven out of ten. Oh! Oh, didn't like it. Oh, that's such a relief. Yeah, it was. Continue. It's uh, it was a six point three until Kate Blanchett has her betrayal moment, and she's like, "Am I powerful enough for you now?" <laughs> and then it immediately dropped half a point. Hmm. Oh wow! I uh, liked a lot of this movie, uh, but it sucks. <laughs> See that? I thought that was a that, that's a line that he said to her or something. Yeah, that's the point. Is that it's like a slam dunk that but she you, gets on him. You still didn't like it. I just hate that she's so obsessed with that one slam dunk he got that oh. she's. Willing to go. I want to talk about that scene later, but for now, David, you don't know how relieved I I am. I really do want to know. I have questions about it. Riley, here's my slogan: I expected a movie called Nightmare Alley to make me scared to sleep, (laughs) but in a surprising twist, it actually put me to sleep. This movie has well-written characters, an intricate plot that weaves together strong themes and motifs into a worthwhile moral tale, but it's also boring as hell, cheesy and predictable. In my opinion, okay, guys, that's just my opinion. I'm giving it a 4.9 out of 10 Wow! because I was like, wow, there's a lot of quality in this movie. Uh, I'm giving it a lot of points for all the things that it did well, but I also, I was, I didn't have a good time. I was, I was bored. I didn't enjoy myself. So it's gotta be a 4.9 because it's just on the, just on the edge of that. James? Whether it's Casino, There Will Be Blood, Goodfellas, Raging Bull, or frankly, Anchorman, Jimmy loves himself a rags to riches to rags story. This one's got a cool look, good actors, and a damn pickled baby. <laughs> I, I'm giving it a leagues better than the piece of crap that was Shape of Water out of 10. Uh, wow. 7.5. Okay. Wow, you didn't like Shape of Water? I, I definitely Shape of Water better. Oh, not me. And then when that won Oscars and stuff, I was like... <laughs> well, th- this was nominated for a ton of Oscars, but the correct it did have uh, correct ones minus Best Picture. It did have a uh, groundbreaking Fishman representation. That's true. There's good stuff. That's good. It was an important <laughs> film for that. Good stuff. Yeah, this, I thought this was a good movie. I'm with the uh, consensus, I think, on IMDb. It's like 7.1 or something like that. I really enjoyed this movie. It was a better than average movie. There's no way it's the most popular movie. It's just what people are talking well, about. Well, I, I mean, mean compared to what? What else is in theaters? That's all that matters in that. Well, now it's Batman. I forget. Now, yeah, it's changed it's now. definitely The Batman. Oh, The Batman. I'm hyped. I'm That's hyped. next But week, we're talking so. about Nightmare. All right, give us the synopsis after I tell you... <laughs> A message from our sole sponsor, Grove oh. Made. Thanks for Grove. Thanks, Grove Made, for sponsoring this video. Grove Made create next level modern desk accessories for your home, your office, and your everyday carry, which is a thing. People put stuff on their bodies, they walk around with it. EDC, baby. They strike a balance between minimalist design and function. Uh, you know, the yin and yang, the Davids and the Rileys. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> their products are made in the USA, believe it or not. So build your dream workspace so you can get your best work done. Look at all the stuff on the table if you're watching the video. They got, there's pen. And holders. There's like a charger for your phone. That thing looks swanky as hell. That belongs in in Kate Blanchett's office in this movie. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about that later. They uh, they make things like laptops and headphone stands, little planters that look cute, good for top down shots and food commercials, all sorts of good stuff. Upgrade your desk today. New customers can use the code TJM for 10% off at lmg.gg/grovemate. And now. A word from our Riley. A word from our synopsis. In 1939, Stanton Carlisle sets fire to a house after dragging a body beneath the floorboards and leaves town on a bus. He takes a job at a carnival where the owner, Clem, forces a captive drug addict, a.k.a. a geek, to eat live chickens in a pit. Clem eventually tells Stan that to break in a geek, he hires vagrants and spikes their drinks with opium. Stan's good reputation grows as he works with Madame Zena and her alcoholic husband, Pete, who begin teaching Stan their act involving cold reading and coded language. But they warn him to never use these skills to lead patrons on after a show. One night, Stan gives Pete a a bottle of wood alcohol, and he dies. Stan takes his book of books of tricks and convinces fellow performer Molly, who who he's in love with, to leave with him. 
Two years later, Stan has become a successful mentalist performer for the wealthy elite, with Molly as his assistant. During a performance, psychologist Dr. Lilith, Lilith Ritter Lilith, Lilith, that's a bit of a tongue twister, attempts to expose their rigged act, but Stan humiliates her with his excellent cold reading skills. Now convinced Stan has psychic abilities, the wealthy Judge Kimball hires him to help him and his wife communicate with their dead son, despite Molly's objections. Ritter, knowing Stan is a con man, offers to give him information on her clients, if he will sit for a session with her. Stan tells Ritter that he hated his alcoholic father, and that's why he doesn't drink, until Ritter kisses him with whiskey on her lips, and the pair's therapy sessions turn into an affair. Stan's next client is Ezra Grindle, whose wife Dory died of a forced abortion. Lover? Wife? Something? Grindle eventually tires of Stan contacting Dory and demands that he make her visibly appear. So Stan plans to have <laughs> Stan's plan. Molly impersonate Dory's spirit. Molly, learning of his affair, eventually agrees to help Stan one last time, but the stunt goes wrong. Grindle learns Molly is a fake and strikes her, promising to destroy Stan, while Grindle's henchman Anderson learns that Judge Kimball and his wife were found dead by murder-suicide. Stan murders them both and escapes with Molly, who promptly abandons him. Stan goes to Ritter to retrieve his scam money, only to discover she'd been stealing it because she despises Stan's hubris. She shoots Stan in the ear, and he tries to strangle her, but is chased out by security. In a flashback, we see Stan kill his father by opening his window to the winter air, taking his blanket and waiting for him to die. Back in the present, Stan has become an has become a homeless alcoholic. He applies for a job at a carnival where the only owner offers him a drink and a job as a fake geek. Geek squad! <laughs> Realizing his fate, Stan laughs and sobs as he answers, Mister, I was born for it. <laughs> I like that final shot. Great ending. It is a good a cool ending. ending. Yeah. This movie I don't is think it, good. I don't think it got there for me. Like the, To me, I, I like the fact that it is a rags to riches to rags story, but I feel like there's quintessential pieces of this movie that they just kind of like jump like the two years later jump when he's gone from a hopeful hopeful young upstart to a cynical tired man i'm like that that's an important piece that, that was actually very structurally weird yeah i was trying to think you know Wait, i always when he's a homeless alcoholic it's two no, years no, later no 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 uh, okay so it's, when he here's why it's weird it's weird because like i always watch uh movies with just like the barely basic formula in mind like third three act structure there's the inciting incident then there's some kind of break into the second act where uh, the world will never be the same and now we're in act two after we've like figured out what the world is and what the characters need changing everything yep. right in this movie the first half of the movie is act one yeah. <laughs> like the build up <laughs> the of like carnival. this is the world the whole car carnival and what's up playing what he's the tricks he's gonna steal in the whole act that's like all act one and then when it goes into act two there's a time jump and like, i just thought can that be allowed? <laughs> or maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way. Maybe that Wait, when would you do a time jump if not uh, from act to act? Um, Within, you could do it in the second act. But wouldn't it be more like common montage. to do it at the time where you're saying it's not common to do it? No, because it's usually it's like the, the jump to the start of the adventure. So you want to go from like one to two. Like, oh, you're like starting the adventure. Most often it happens within act one, probably. I think I think it, it totally would depend. Like it doesn't have to happen on an act break. Like it could happen at the midpoint. Yeah. For it, example, and then you're still because even Act Two is often seen as Act Two A and Act Two B. Like there's different right. hemispheres of it. But um, it just seems weird to go from like okay now he, he we know what he wants and we're gonna go see if he can be the thing he wants to be. We know like what he's up against and like will he attain that? Uh, go and give us the part of the movie that we came to see. Uh, the thing we saw in the trailers. Yeah. The fun and games. Oh, you wanted to see, but then the... instead it's like boop, and he just <laughs> it jumps because it's not really about that. It's not about like can he be a magician? Yeah. Can he be a successful mentalist? No. It's about like can he be a, like a good person? Yeah. So we don't need to see his rise to fame. Yeah, which is fair. Uh, did you guys find that the movie felt really split into two movies? I felt like mm. that jump totally divides the movie, and like there's the first movie which felt like what the trailers had promised, and even like the tone promise of the movie was the first half, and then. It switches to something kind of different, uh, and I had a hard time re-engaging with the second part. That wasn't a problem for me. It does switch. It, it goes from kind of that we're all working the carnival together to this quid pro quo, Mr. Carlisle. Like, mm -hmm. you're going to do this. Um, it's almost like how, I don't know, what movie was it recently? You're like, you're watching Star Wars, and then suddenly it's a heist movie. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, that stuff happens. That, yeah. that didn't bother me. When did that... So you're saying that happens uh, halfway through? 
like from going from the carnival to the future? Almost halfway, yeah. Yeah, it it felt like a long time. But I think I what did I write down? I wrote down that like thirty eight minutes in, <laughs> I was like, this movie's going slow. It's thirty eight minutes in, and I've yet to be hooked because I was just kind of like, let's go, like like make something happen. So I was I, engaged that whole time. Yeah, I actually liked the first half quite a bit. I enjoyed that journey of. Like the mystery of, of surrounding Stan, and he arrives at the carnival, and you're kind of seeing him charm the people, and it feels like it's he's a good man trying his best, and like he obviously has a shady past, but I I was won over by Bradley Cooper uh, and all the different characters and all like the little mysteries. I wish that there was a little bit more of like the horror elements in the first half, but once I let go of that expectation, I just enjoyed the 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 group dynamic I had a good time. what do you think of the fact that he doesn't speak very much for the first like 15 minutes yeah he barely talks i wrote down that i felt like i was wa- like watching a video game kind of he's, he's, he's i wrote that down too late. yeah especially because when he goes to get hired he just like exits the tent and they're like hey you <laughs> like oh, okay i guess i could use some help it's like he didn't even offer like yeah. what <laughs> <laughs> like uh, yeah, it, it felt the like best, a protagonist. The best like, negotiation tactic is to just not say anything. <laughs> That's what keeps happening. <laughs> he's linked. Willem Dafoe will say something to him, and then he just like walks away. He's like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Here's a better offer for you. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but then he does speak, and when he when he does, it's not like a, a grand revelation. It's not like the first thing he says. We're like, whoa. Yeah. He just he talks to the geek is, is his first line actually. And he's just like, hey buddy, what you, I'm coming over there. It's a pretty normal line yeah. it's not so i, I don't know what to make of it. it it almost felt like non unintentional like it at first it felt intentional but then like you say because of how he ends up speaking for the first time it all it almost was like wait you were saving almost, it for this i almost think though when you see the grand picture of the movie that it is intentional that he starts close to being a geek but he kind of is able to elevate himself out of it through the love of these people but then when he falls back into it like he's by himself and he doesn't speak nearly as much like that final montage of him as a homeless person he doesn't really say anything. It's the homeless people that are like, hey, man, you got to carry your weight at some point. And he's just like. Right. And so I think that it's like it's helping to tie that arc with a beginning. and a Oh, yeah, yeah. That's silence. good because I detected that he at the end. I'm like, oh, he's going to be the geek. Yeah. Not because I'm a genius, but because the movie tells us when he's running down, he's hiding. He's yeah. running away from his uh, pursuers and he's going down the train tracks. And he, he's like, huh. <gasps> grunting. I'm like, oh, he's grunting like an animal. Uh, yeah. And then he gets into the train and he hides behind chickens. chickens. I was like, oh, chickens. Yeah. And then Chick- it, then it's like, after that, it's straight on, you're going to be the geek. Yeah. But um, oh, I like that idea. Another thing I think they're doing is having him morally ambiguous at the beginning. Because mm-hmm. the opening shot of the image, or the opening image of the movie, the opening shot is so great because it poses so many questions. Right. He's dragging this body. And at first, you might be like, okay, are you a killer? Did you kill that guy? Are you evil? Are you going to be in trouble? Are you on the run now? We don't know. The next time we see that flashback, there's an old man there. They're like, oh, he didn't kill anybody. He's just he's burying a loved one. Now he's a good guy. Yeah. And then so they, we don't have time or we're not afforded the opportunity in the first like 50 minutes to make more judgment calls about this guy's character because he doesn't give us anything. And then the movie flip flops back and forth, like yep. giving us more and more information about how despicable he is over yep. time. Right, right. No, yeah, I think that that does serve that purpose for him to be silent because I was on his side, and that uh, the first half does feel. I, I wrote down like it kind of feels like a TV show because we're like we're learning about these characters, but it's also skipping through time a lot. Um, and I was just like, <laughs> it's definitely taking its time with this thing, and that's why I, I felt sort of like, all right, let's hurry up, let like let, let's get moving. Um, and then later, yeah, he, he really goes on. He start, it starts becoming more apparent that this is definitely a tragedy. I mean, I don't know. Did you guys know that that was what you were in store for right off the top? I, I didn't have any spoilers. No, I, I didn't know that it was going to be Rags to Riches the Rags. I thought maybe he's going to break free. Like, yeah, I didn't know it was quite oh, that I thought you meant. I thought you meant, like, did we? Did I know he was going to be the one who killed his dad or something? Oh, no, no, no. You well, just mean, did I know, like, It was going to be a tragedy. To me, the op- Oh, that's right. Uh, well, I think another reason they have the silence aspect is for us to like the character because it's going to be more dramatic for us when his downfall will be more dramatic if we like him a lot. So yeah. maybe when he's silent, we just put more of ourselves into him. I see that. Yeah, I assumed that he was good because of his silence. And he's good looking. Yeah. You know, we like good it's looking true. people. He, he does. They do a lot in the beginning to show the struggle, like even just the physicality of setting up the tents and stuff, the way they make it seem really grueling, I think makes you have some kind of empathy for that character on top of his silence. So I think it's just all working towards making you... Yeah, and he's, like, getting another chance. Yeah. Then he's trying to improve things. He proves uh, competence. You know, he's like, I'm going to make this show better. Then he's a good artist. We love that. There's no reason for him to be good at drawing at all. 
Yeah. He oh, right. Great electric chair. Yeah, I'm going yeah, to make an electric chair. What's that? Oh, it's the drawing I made. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's the point? I thought that something was going to come from the drawing or whatever, because, like, why are you such a good artist? But it's just like, yeah, it's just a, a, a he's, secondary he's, skill he has. He's drawing people's thoughts out of them. Mm, well, we yeah. do see <laughs> it, it makes a difference later when um, his girlfriend Molly is looking through the book and sees oh, that's a fair. half drawn image of this other woman. That's true. Yeah. They worked that in. Wait a second. What? No, that's what she said. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, go on, Dave. Go, Dave. What you do you something? think of those flashbacks with the dad? Because I actually really like the way they rolled it out. Like you said, they kind of you're not sure if it's murder or if it's just like natural causes. And that final payoff of him, the way he kills his dad, I love by exposure. I, by exposure, uh. and it's like such a brilliant way of like getting away with it. But it's so cruel, and the way he takes the blanket, so wraps it around cruel. himself, yeah. and you're like, you're such a piece of shit. Yeah. But like, it just works for me. Oh, it's very cruel. And it does it it. It does a good job of like making you now feel retroactively that you should have hated him from the beginning, because like we're like, oh, that's why he was silent and that's why he was like looking to get away and stuff because he did this horrible thing, yeah. because of trauma. It, like we learned as, as well that his his dad was an alcoholic, um, his mom left, and so he was like, he wasn't shown the image of what proper good love looks like, so he just like acted out and was a horrible person himself. Cycle of abuse. You know what's another great aspect of this is I was fully tricked as an audience member. There's a there's a shot where Carlisle's watching uh, Zena do her show, and it's the time when Zena does a bit of a spook show, but then after the show she tells oh, the yeah, audience yeah. member that it's a fake or whatever. And you can see there's a shot of Carlisle like looking at and just realizing when he's looking at the spook show, and I thought, oh, this is. I actually wrote down this is the first time he sees the carnival as unethical. And then the very next scene, he's like, you could have got way more with that lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> like, like, oh, that, no, that's not I was it. like, oh, I was wrong. It's not the ethics. What is happening here? Yeah. He's seeing the competence, or he's so, seeing like a, a, a way for him to Yeah, they totally successful. succeeded in making me give him the benefit of the doubt. Right. Well, especially because he's so respectful as well when he comes and like asks Pete for training or whatever, and he's like, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, I really appreciate it. But yeah. He's like, he's very polite. I really like the, all that, the, the revealing the tricks behind it, like the way they reveal the coded the coded messages so they can communicate. I thought all that stuff was neat. I didn't like, I hate when movies, someone does like a cold read of someone and they're so on point and they're <laughs> so clever. And I'm like, yeah. no, it's just like, uh, it's like, it's such an artificial situation. Cause like he's shooting in the dark and taking crazy chances. And like, because it's a movie, he has to get it right. But it just feels so like a writer being like, Oh, look how clever I am. But it's like, actually you're not. Cause you created the whole situation. Yeah. You yeah. feel like that applies to this movie? Yeah. The, a few a few of the cool reads when he's like talking sure. about the person stuff. I'm like, it could have been so many things. <laughs> I know. Yeah. The first is is more like that than the first reading when Pete does Carlisle. And he's just like, Yeah, look, buddy, everybody has issues with their dad. Yeah, that one I yeah, that one right. I that one was good. I think the the police officer was also good, but it's like starting to get to the point where you're just like, eh, really though? And then when he's <laughs> when he reads Lilith and he's like okay, you're insecure or whatever, you feel the need to be powerful over other people, blah, blah, blah. And because you're wealthy, nickel-plated ivory handle. It's like, wait, wait, wait. What? Is this like a super common pistol configuration Maybe. or something? You it's would like, think so. You would think. I guess that's what I took from the movie. Right, but like, I don't know. I imagine that there's all sorts of tiny pistols that people can have. Yeah, but that'd person. be like today if I was like doing a read on some basic person and I was like, and pumpkin spice latte and she's like oh it's like yeah <laughs> well they literally all are drinking yeah, if pumpkin you use spice. that example you're wearing lululemon pants my point is that <laughs> i don't know if nickel plated ivory handle pistols are the pumpkin spice lattes of this uh <laughs> eth or for a woman like that demographic yes. yeah <laughs> here's another reason uh, a foreshadowing thing i thought was right after he drags that body and puts in the ground and walks straight from that burning house the next shot is he gets on a train and he falls asleep so we know about this character is he can sleep easy yeah, after even. burying somebody and burning their house down. Mm, right. So look out. You know? I read that as him just being exhausted. And also... <laughs> and, oh, look at this tired man. <laughs> well, he just, bur <laughs> he just dragged... He was super tired dragging the body. It's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I think most... A lot of people would have just stared out the window after what they had just I done. Also, I also was like... I was hoping that this movie would have some sort of like supernatural element to it. I don't know. Because I always feel like when movies... Sometimes it's cheap. I wrote down that this is this movie is the prestige but worse. Because it's like <laughs> it's of. very similar in terms of like people pretending to have abilities but really they don't. And the the twist and spoilers for the prestige. Okay. 
Should I spoil it for Steve? They should watch our Skip episode. Ahead. We did an Skip episode ahead for a minute. If you have okay, I won't spoil it. But in anyways, in this one, it turns out that there's no supernatural anything, and I was just kind of like, ah, oh. like I. I think when he shows up in on the bus and it's like a sort of a fade transition. Yeah. It's one shot and but the background just changes into the carnival or whatever. Yeah, and it and also gets like, cold and frosty and stuff. I was, yeah, and it I was like, paranormal. oh, is he in like another dimension or something? Yeah. I actually <laughs> yeah. thought that as well. Like, oh, maybe yeah. we're inside his mind or something yeah. now or but no. It, it was just like yeah. time passes. That but, was a ten hour train ride. Which I guess is like, <laughs> you know, it's a good parallel for the whole idea in the movie where he pretends that he has abilities, but he actually doesn't, and he gets to the point where he even like believes his own lie. As Pete warned him, that's my favorite part in the movie. As long as we're talking about good parts, when uh, Pete is like warning him not to like believe, start to believe his own lie. What do you call it? Shut eye or something? Yeah, that's right. When you start to believe your own lies, you get shut eye. And he's like, "You lie and you lie, and when the lies end, the face of God is staring you at the end, and no man can outrun God." Stan. Yeah, it's a total fable. Everything yeah. that's going to happen is said to him. <laughs> yeah. Again and again, people are like, don't do this. Yeah. And at that moment, as well, you know, as an audience member, like, oh, he's going to, yeah, he's going to get there. Yeah. It's exactly like that <laughs> nursery rhyme where, the, you know, that kiddies don't help bake the pie and then they're not allowed to have the pie or whatever it is. You know, you didn't help us. You know, <laughs> what? or whatever. I whatever. Know this. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's another cool moment is when uh, I love the Willem Dafoe character and he's kind of like showing him the ropes and showing him how the, the uh, geek works, oh my God. and when they're confronting the geek, uh, the, they're putting him back in the cage. William Defoe's character says, "Step right up, busy man or beast," and that makes the geek like res- retreat further into mm. the cage. Like it's like this weaponized thing. Oh, Dehumanizing yeah. the yeah. geek is right. a weapon against the geek. Oh, that that's was- another. That's another point when I thought there was maybe going to be supernatural stuff because I'm like, oh, is this guy actually like a vampire? Did they capture a vampire or something? <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought it was gonna be supernatural too. Yeah, yeah is yeah. that just because of the uh, baggage being to the movie, knowing that it's you know, Del probably yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and I think the trailer too made it seem like it was gonna be a carnival psychological horror, uh, and it was gonna be like he's gonna face his guilt and all these things through like the imagery of a carnival. Right. And I thought that was more interesting. Like when he goes through the funhouse to catch the geek, I was like, oh, here we go, we're getting the good shit. Yeah. Uh, and the movie kind of just like to me decreases in visual interest. Like when it's in the second half in Buffalo, Buffalo. Um, no offense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't bother putting it in the synopsis. I was like, why? <laughs> like, okay, sure, whatever. It doesn't matter. I found it much less visually interesting. I think like the there's some sets that are pretty good. I really like her office. Like that's what I was gonna it's say. Her so office cool. is, is really cool. Even like when he steps out of the elevator, I was like, where are we? And then we step into her office. It's that's great, but there's nothing quite as like imagination capturing as I think the carnival was. No. Mm-hmm. And I wish that we kind of had a return to it in a sense that like. That, that that escalates there, and we get some crazy psychological vi- visuals, but that's not what the movie. No, is. not no. I didn't watch the trailer, so I didn't have that going into it. But there are some. I like the look of this movie. We should talk yeah, about it. It has sure. oh, it really? has a definite yeah. mood. It has its own look, and there are great shots. Like there's this awesome shot I noticed where uh, it's when Grindel and Carlisle are walking into the garden when it's snowing right mm. before the big kind of climax, and the camera, it's like a oneer. It's like a ten or twelve second oneer one shot and the camera does this like uh turning kind of arc follow them and then they walk basically they walk and they take a turn and then they're walking on untrodden snow Mm -hmm. there's no footprints so either they took a lot of time to reset or they actually just did that in one take and it's nice it's pretty cool Mm. there's so many beautiful shots in this movie i it's got the signature like del toro style of everything being duotone where it's like there's a lot of like the the what does that mean it's basically where there's like two (laughs) colors are the primary focus of the frame so uh in this one it's mostly teal and orange so he's pushing the warm and cold into kind of like extremes but he usually does that um but it'll the most of his movies have two colors it'll be like green and red or shape of water was again orange teal uh but it also kind of shifted and this one it never he does he has this incredible talent to push the color into like a totally unbelievable space without it feeling fake or cheap and on every frame in this movie is eye-catching see i man that's i guess that's where i it felt super cheap to me. Like it, really? I, I didn't. It didn't seem believable at all. Like, I, like, <clears throat> um, it seemed like uh, not a student film, but something where they tried too hard to hit like a certain aesthetic, mm. and it's almost like they were, it, like the 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 sets didn't feel real to me. Like it felt they felt like sets. They looked like sets. Like it looked like we got a bunch of props and put it in place here. I, I don't know. Like I think it was like. 
because there's sort of like a surrealist, like a dreamlike yeah. quality to it's it. It's a dreamlike quality yeah. to it. There's a lot of, you know, it is noir, so that we're using a lot of like weird angles and stuff, and sh- and sharp lighting, and and I think that it just like it makes it doesn't it makes it feel more like a play to me. And I was, For sure. just, yeah, and so I didn't I didn't believe that uh, I did, I wasn't immersed for a second, and I think I was disappointed by that. That's partially why it was so boring to me because I I was like. Ah, uh, the the stakes aren't here. I don't care about what's happening because I don't think that this is real because it seems so fake. It did seem like a play to me as well, especially scenes like um when he was in the bathhouse and um P- like Peter walks in for the first time. Just the blocking they had in that scene, the camera just wasn't switching to one person very often. It was kind of showing the three of them talking because mm. um, Zena was there as well. And I just thought, I feel like I'm looking at a stage yeah. rendition of this. And I think that like Guillermo... Guillermo del Toro uh, does this a little bit. I feel like I've, I've seen in. It seems like he kind of does it. He doesn't really care about the the places that he's filming seeming as if they could exist in real life. It it. He, I think he cares about making it like kind of look interesting as sort of like a, it's almost. I'm thinking like Bioshock, where it's like mm. I don't believe that this place could be a real place, but it's but it is visually interesting. You know, like you you crafted this scene with the set decks and stuff, but like I don't believe this is a real place. You know, it, okay. It's just like kind of otherworldly. It kind of is yeah. like larger than life. I love sort of. It is kind of cartoony or like. Yeah. It's like yeah. I, I get what you're saying. It's, it's communicative to though. It totally. Which is fine because like when he goes to he time jumps and then he has that his hotel room. The ceiling has all this cool molding. It's like um I don't have to describe it. It's like a bunch of rings. It looks really cool. I thought the production designers did a great job on that. But all it needed to communicate to me was, oh, he's doing pretty well. Yeah, right. he's he's making it because that looks yeah. expensive. No, I think it communicates it it communicates what it wants to communicate for sure. I think I just like I think when I'm watching a movie, I value the ability of the movie to for, make me forget that I'm watching a movie, and that doesn't do that. That's uh, definitely not what the movie's going. For. Right, it's, it it certainly leans into its artifice. You seem uh, confused. Well, I just you love Grand Budapest Hotel, so I'm just like, what is Riley? Well, like? because what, when it's like super upfront about it, when it's like, hey, this is like a storybook. And you're watching this, like, we made all these miniatures and they look like miniatures. We're, we're, there's no, like, with in a lot of Wes Anderson stuff, there's no attempt to make you believe it. And you know that they're not trying to make you believe it because you're literally just watching these little clay figures do stuff. So then it's like when the when the attempt at at immersion is gone, when, you, when, when it's being up front with its artifice, I'm like, cool. So in this movie, you're like sitting on the couch thinking, you're trying to trick me. <laughs> No, I just no, <laughs> like, no. I'm thinking. I'm thinking you screwed up. I, just not, I, I, they didn't lean far enough into it. It's yeah, kind of in it's like no it's, man's land. make it either incredibly surrealistic that it's obvious that you are trying to do that, or make it realistic so that I'm tricked into thinking that I, it's real. I You're actually, a special guy. No, I agree. No, I wish, this is how most uh, people watch movies. I, 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 I'm okay with the artifice, but I wish that they le- like leaned into the surreal of it. Right, um, and I think that would have been like a way to just like. Give me a little bit of spice in this movie because it's it's fucking long, man. Yeah, two it's and a half so hours, long. And it, I don't think it needs to be two hours, two and a half hours. Mm. It could have been less than two hours, and I think they could have communicated the same thing. But if we're getting these really cool surreal moments that are just heightening the scenes or giving you like a visual punctuation on what's going on, it would have been better. I think I I'm, I agree. I I wish that it leaned more into the surreal. Yeah. I wish that it I wish that it was like upfront with being with with the artifice. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's when it's when movies don't seem like they're being upfront. Mm-hmm. And they tried to make it realistic, but they didn't quite get there. Yeah. Then it feels weird to me. Yeah. I have one last point on the visuals, which is I appreciate the classical lighting style they use. There's a lot of harsh lighting, uh, especially on characters, where we've kind of gone away from that style. We are in a more diffuse, natural look, uh, right. whereas this is very stagey. There's lots of like spotlights on people's faces and harsh shadows. Mm. And it really helps, uh, even though it doesn't feel real, it helps to create a sense of time that I think this movie succeeds in right. presenting. And we didn't, we haven't really mentioned that, like, obviously, this is a. The remake, or a re imagining reboot. <laughs> I, I don't think any of us have yeah. seen the original. And it's, I think that like visual elements elements like that are sort of a callback to when was it? When did it come out? Nineteen forty seven. So like that era of filmmaking. Yeah, it has those uh, little vignette cutaways. What are those called? Those are like the uh, oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, where like, like the that mask, German style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called an Irish shot or an Irish round transition. Uh, Lots of Irish shots. <laughs> Shot, shot, <laughs> shot, shot, shot. No, you'll see it in those like vampire <laughs> movies and stuff. Yeah. Like, what's that wave of German film called? Is it German expressionism. There it is. The vampire and the vamp, the vampire. Metropolis. 
Um, I just thought of something that I forgot to mention earlier when I was talking about uh, Pete giving him the warning of like, oh, you can't own run God. You'll see the face of God. And who ends up being his reckoning? Uh, Ezra Grindle, who kind of looks like the traditional depiction of God. The architect from Matrix 2. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Well, he's got like no, no. But he, basically, he's like an old man with a, like a big white beard or whatever. It's, it seems like I was like, is there some sort of like imagery there? And then well, you can't outrun God, but you sure can knock his nose in. Yeah, and <laughs> then he ends up killing God. Yeah. He man definitely was blinded by his hubris because that plan was stupid. Like stupid. the whole time, it's like, what if he just, what if he walks over to her? Yeah, yeah exactly. What, what if he sees her clearly? What if he touches her? Like, anyway? Oh, we better stay back or whatever. He's like, fuck you, dude. Like, uh, you know, it's like that's my or not, I guess wife. In the synopsis, it said lover. It doesn't really matter. They're not married. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. I looked for a ring. Oh, nice. Mm, I have a note. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> it's implied that like she's just one of the women that he abused, but he loved her the most or something. I thought that the love was genuine, actually. I didn't get the sense. Oh, for sure. It wasn't like um, maybe in There Will Be Blood where, uh, this is not a spoiler, it's part of the beginning. You know how he has that kid and he like uses the kid as part of his sales pitch? Yep. I didn't get the sense he was just using Molly. I think he genu genuinely did love her. Oh, yeah. But sure. he was just so obsessed that he wasn't able to love her properly. Right. At the end, uh, w the way that he, like, gets her back, uh, not at the end, I guess, but almost, uh, where he... At the train station or whatever? Yeah, he says, like, everyone in my life has abandoned me. Please don't... Such an abusive... Yeah, fucking, yeah. manipulate it. But, but, like, it's also true, you know? He's, like, that. that's true to his experience, yeah. that everyone in his life has abandoned him. Um, yeah, because you're a dick. Yeah, well, in this case, it's because you're a dick. Yeah, 100%. Yo, can mom we left talk about that actress left for a second? A dick. Yeah. Yeah. I had a note that was like, this chick really looks like that other chick. Uh, so Rooney Mara <laughs> really looks like Thomas and Mackenzie from... Uh, a little bit, yeah. Uh, but, Last yeah. Night in Solo, and she's in that Wes Anderson movie. Which one? The Boy Scout one. <laughs> Last Night in Solo. Oh, uh, solo. <laughs> Moon, Moonrise Kingdom. Moonrise Kingdom, and she's also in uh, Joe Rabbit. Jojo Rabbit. Jojo Rabbit. I'm like... <laughs> I'm... <laughs> What's that character in uh, Trailer Park Boys? Rand, not Randy. Yeah, the main one. Anyways, Bubbles. I can't even oh. do this. I'm really bad at saying stuff today. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you dressed like Indianapolis Jones? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like I'm like a boomer right now. Like my my boomer in law mom. She can't even. Say, she says vegan instead of vegan. I I do that sometimes too by accident, but then I try to correct myself. I want to talk about the characters and the performances. Yeah, I'm not done her. that yet. So okay, Rooney yeah. Mara. That's her last name. <laughs> Yeah. Mara? Rooney Mara. Those are both her last names. Her real name is Patricia, but her stage name is just Rooney Mara. But her, her whole family, it's like her dad's last name and her mom's last name put together. It's oh. a two-part last namer, but she just doesn't have a first name. Her sister Kate ha didn't get to do that. There's all these other Rooney Maras. Her first name's Pat Patricia? I just think it's weird. Well, it's a good thing that she went with this. I I'm going to call her PRM. That's what it weird. PRM. Uh, I think... Her performance is fine. She doesn't ha not have enough to do. They, they do not define no. that character nearly. Seemed enough. like she was going to. Yeah. That stuff. Well, she's just kind of the moral presence, right? She's yep. there to, to to tell us that uh, he sucks. But you're right. I think that they could have like fleshed her out. Like, what is she about? Like, what does she actually want? Other than okay, I guess I'll go with you. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, she I, thinks. Well, we know that she thinks that spook shows are unethical. Does she? Well, she wants, or at to least do dangerous. It. Yeah, she doesn't want to do that. This is what confused me about like the ethics of the characters, because it's like, how do these people have an idea of what's ethical while a drug addict guy is being kept uh, against his will, eating do, chickens? Do you think everyone's aware of what uh, Willem Dafoe is doing? Or? Oh, I think everyone knows about the geek. Yeah, okay. yeah, but do they all know that he's strung out on heroin? Uh, yes. Why does that matter? What do you mean? Why does that matter? He's kept being kept against his uh, well, will in a cage. Because they might just think they might just buy into the whole. Like, I mean, oh, like, he—that's a weird person. Sorry, right. I, I, it makes it makes sense to me in this world where like everything's fucked that uh, they're just kind of like that's the business, you know, that's carnivals. Like everybody's got a geek, and so they're used to it or whatever. I just feel like it's it's a little it's a little inconsistent morally. Well, I thought I think it is. They didn't do Once enough philosophical introspection to understand the uh, right. the problems here. I'm pretty. I think that <laughs> even within the universe of the movie, Willem Dafoe's use of opium on the geek is a secret. It's a trade secret. He's when yeah. he only reveals that when he's telling uh, Carlisle how to do that. Here's how you make a geek. And and once I found out that he's just actually keeping this guy drugged or not drugged uh, perfectly to make him crazy, that was more unethical to me. Oh yeah, it gets more unethical for sure. But now I you just made me think about the fact that like oh I I think I took for granted that everyone probably just knew that he was addicted to opium. 
and maybe they just thought he was like crazy. Yeah, that's what I thought they yeah. thought. And they, they just, were just like, yeah. oh, we you know, we keep him in a cage because if he gets out, he's just a danger to everyone yeah. and himself. He's well, just I mean, a crazy, like, a mentally unwell person who eats chicken necks. And the movie kind of leans into that because the, the one time we see him out of his cage, he does attack Bradley Cooper. Like, he's running, but yeah. he, he, yeah. he, he strikes first. Well, and that's how the show is sold. Right. right? Yeah. Here's a, we have a weird wild man. And Stan, when he encounters the geek, he tries talking to him as if he's just like a normal person, but everyone else is like, what are you doing? Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Yeah. I like Willem Dafoe's I take it back. character. I like how he's towing the line of like, kind of like charming carnival man with like a little bit of of uh, shroud of mystery until that revelation. You're like, oh, he's a piece of shit. Yeah. But you still like him because Willem Dafoe is so charismatic, and it's like, I mean, I didn't like him. Ah, I don't know. I still like him. <laughs> <laughs> Not as like a human, but certainly as a character. Yeah, I think he did a good job. I think Willem Dafoe did a good job. Yeah. At being this like sleazy guy, Willem Dafoe can do this thing where he can either be this like horrible sleazy person that you hate, or just like he's seen some shit and he's got, he's a kind soul. <laughs> yeah, but he looks like he's got the he's got that look, look where he could just like his story tells a face, he, he, or his <laughs> face, his face Dude, tells a story. It's early. I think he yeah. can really do anything. Like in the Florida Project, he's just a really nice, kind man. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. then in lots of other movies, he's crazy, mean or whatever. And he can also be comic relief, like in. Uh, Life Aquatic. He could basically be like, <laughs> he's kind of like a, a rich man's Steve Buscemi. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, hey, we need a weird face guy. Well, not That's that so weird. Great. Not crazy eyes. That's such not a that good weird. description. That's so a rich funny. man, Steve Buscemi. Buscemi's like poor man's <laughs> Willem Dafoe. I, don't know. I, sir, I respect Steve Buscemi. He's good. But anyways, I have some questions for you guys. Sure. Please. Uh, when Carlisle goes to the bathhouse for the first time, he goes... Hey, hey, can I leave this open? The front door. He wants to leave the front door open. And I assume that's to not scandalize yeah. the neighborhood, right? Because he's talking to this woman on the front porch, Zena, and then she's like, yeah, come in for a bath. Get naked and have a bath. So he's he's like, this is not a, this is not a whore not a house. Hookup, yeah. I'm going to leave the door open so because everybody knows. That's what he's asking at first, right? He's like, you got a tub? And the implication is that it's like, oh, we offer baths, but is is it actually just baths or is it something else? Yeah, so he really right. does want it to be on the up and up. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't know why Why does she, why do they have sex? Yeah. Why is that in this movie? Yeah, what does that do? Yeah, it felt so out of place. It felt really strange, especially because nothing really comes of it later. I've never looked at Tony Collette that way. <laughs> I mean, now I can't neither. stop. Well, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> I, so I could kind of understand. Uh, No, I couldn't. I couldn't. Understand why his, why her character why she did that. It's part of his ethical signaling to say like he isn't morally pure, or do you think it's more to signal that like he kind of just goes along for the ride? I don't know. If he doesn't put up much resistance. Is it like a gateway drug? Like maybe he he starts off really he's really trying to do his best and turn his life around. Yeah. But then that's like the first sin. Like yeah. he didn't choose. He didn't want that. He he really he wanted to leave the door open. He really yeah. just wanted a bath. And then suddenly he's an adulterer. And Maybe. then he ends up taking everything from Pete. Well, yeah, he kills him. And so, yeah, it kind of makes it more morally complex or, like, more layered. But it, it, it does feel weird. He it doesn't... He yeah. takes his, his woman, his tricks, his life. Yeah. And that, that's and did kind he of the do first... On, so I miss it. Did he do it on purpose or was it an accident? What, have sex that's another there? question. The question that when he kills Pete. The sex was accidental, for sure. Well, yeah, <laughs> she, she wanted it. He just went with it. I feel like it was on purpose. Because, but I didn't think that it was on, on, at that time in the movie. I was like, oh, he still cares about Pete and, you know, he cares about people. Mm. Yeah, I, th I still thought that he was maybe like a decent person. Yeah. But, but the then end. later, I think that I, w I wrote down, I was like, wait. Like, I think like half an hour later after Pete dies, I was just like, wait, did he kill Pete? Well, uh, Kate, Kate Blanchett's character asks, right? And he kind of has a breakdown about it. Mm -hmm. And he never confirms or denies. He just says, he cries that guy shot it. his shot. So yeah. there's there, speaking of shots. But I think he could be crying because he is guilty, guilty about it, but he still is like, you know, I did it for a reason yeah. or whatever. Right, because there is a shot when he's getting the drink, because Defoe's character explains, red bucket bad, blue bucket One good. Of the stupidest there, fucking scenes in the whole. There's movie. a shot of <laughs> yeah. him getting the drink, and I guess he pulls it out of the red bucket, right? So the question. No, is, he doesn't. I, does it show us that? So I thought it was ambiguous because it shows him putting a coin in because he's not supposed to just well, take he just it. Leaves he's, it. He he's leaves got a coin. He, oh, he thought he, he sits it on it. Oh, right, it's right, fine, right. It's fine. He, he leaves a coin and then it cuts. I don't think it shows him t picking up a bottle. So it's like ambiguous. It's ambiguous at that point which bottle he picks up. But you, yeah. you know, as an audience, you're like, well, 
fucking killing them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't know that at the time. Oh, really? I I hate that cheap ass loaded gun. They're like, okay, we have delicious sugar alcohol and we have poisonous wood alcohol. I'm gonna put them in identical crates next to each other, color coded <laughs> in the crate. But the bottles, oh no, yeah. they're the same bottles. Ooh, which one is it? I feel like this is a good microcosm of the movie for me. No one else got James, why you, why James, you say it that way. <laughs> James used this word earlier. Um, because it's like, okay, you've set things up. There's a neat setup thing that will allow you to have this uh, sort of twisty thing where, oh, whoops, he gave him that wood alcohol instead of the good alcohol. <laughs> it rhymes. But, <laughs> but it seems contrived. It seems like... I don't believe that it's real. Yeah, you know, and that I think that's where it came down to in my slogan, where I was like, "There are well-written characters. It's good, intricate plot. There's lots of details. There's lots of work put into making like foreshadowing over here and like co thematic color choices and blah 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 blah." Um, but it just all seems very contrived. It totally. seems like I can see I can see Guillermo del Toro in this movie. Well, I think that like he's a very creative man and his vision is strong, but. Mm. I think he needs to kind of go back under the wing of studios. Like, yeah. I, some people are going to hate me for that because I think the strength of this movie is that he gets to do whatever he wants. Like, he goes and gets the funding and he makes these really creative projects. Right. But lots of his last movies, man, they just need, like, a little bit of refinement and, like, a little bit sanded down into kind of a more, a tighter story. Yeah, it, like, this is great. There's so much good shit, but, like, there's also just, like, kind of dumb yeah, shit. It's sad. It's sad when you see a very, very creative, visionary person like him, uh... Get the success, and so then people think that he just needs to do whatever yeah. he wants. Is a George Lu Lucas situation, yeah. where it's like he had really great ideas. He can come up with stories and characters and themes that people want to see that are like compelling. Yeah. But he needs some. He needs a technical person to rein him in. Be like, hey, this doesn't work because of this. Let's like refine this a little bit more and make this like much more and much it, better. So yeah, Mo, if you want to hire us, yeah. You know where to find and it. And before you guys get mad about what I just said, watch Crimson Peak and then tell me he doesn't need some fucking guidance. Is it a bad movie? Awful. <laughs> it's a piece of shit. It's gorgeous, and there's like great shit about right. it, but man, it sucks. But on the <laughs> other hand, Pacific Rim. Yeah, too much. Too much studio. That was a joke. I like Pacific Rim, but I, it's too much. Studio. I mean, it's like a dumb action movie. But Hellboy yeah, okay. 2, perfect. No, Pan's Labyrinth. Pacific perfect. Rim 2. Oh, he did <laughs> Hellboy 2. He did Hellboy 2. That's why Hellboy's in this movie. Oh, Ron, oh, yeah, Perlman? Ron Perlman? Yeah, he's in every, he's in all his movies. Oh, he's one of his people. Oh, is he? Oh, folks. okay. When he punches him, I'm like, oh, a Hellboy punching you. <laughs> <laughs> that character was good. What's up with the baby in the jar? What does that represent? I think it represents his demons. See, I think it represents the the thing he's trying to overcome that he fails to overcome. See, I think that this is one of those like intricate plot details that I was talking about because the baby is in many ways just like a not a foil per se, I guess, but it like represents him. He the baby killed its mother in childbirth, and like his mother ran away potentially because of like. Toxic, toxic things going on with him and his dad or whatever. I don't know. Uh, it's got the third eye going on, and he's wearing a blindfold uh, with a third eye on it when he does his oh, act. Oh, true, true, true. And, uh, you know, I don't know. It goes from carnival to carnival. It's being like like a story is is told about it, and he's kind of like trying to craft this narrative about himself. I think that it just, it like, it, it, it serves as sort of a thematic rhyming scheme type of thing to, for his character. Yeah, it seems to, but it seems to appear, to me it represents like the thing he's trying to overcome, like the demon he's battling, uh, just because of the placement of it. Like mm. it goes away for a time right? and then it's back. Yeah, and, you know, and escape. He doesn't actually end up overcoming it. And then in the ending, the ending credits were like going inside its brain. Right. We're, we're all up in it. Yeah. So it yeah. definitely, it was it's important. One of those, it's one of those like kind of touchstones throughout the movie. You're like. What are they saying with this? Well, I mean, right. this, you can go like full stupid YouTube analyst and be like, oh, you know, he never got to grow up, so he's like a baby and he's like pickled in alcohol. <laughs> uh, like, oh, yeah, true, true, yeah. True. Hey, that's good. Did it. Someone can steal it. But like, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. The movie has tons of this stuff, but I just don't feel it. I think that's a good, uh, a strong point of the movie. Like, I yeah, feel like I'm it's rewatchable. I'm saying. I think this movie's got I'm, some I'm layers. Putting, I'm putting that as a pro. It's good. I actually do. I wrote that down. I think that with repeat watchings, I would enjoy it more. The biggest one just being I shuck my expectation and I meet the level on its on its. You meet it where goal. it's at. Yeah, and I, I, a lot of movies do that. I I found the opposite with Shape of Water. My first watch, I was like, I love this movie. And the more you watch it, you're like, yeah, it's kind of dumb. Uh, this I, doesn't make sense. I saw it in the theater. I didn't like it then. Yeah. 
But you know what? I had Doritos. Like I had, uh, no- you know, when you buy the theater nachos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was trying to dip stuff, and uh, it was the yeah. one time I went to the expensive theater where you get your own huge seat, yeah, your own like section, seat. and they serve alcohol and stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah. just trying to don't order stuff you have to dip. No, no. yeah, I hate doing that. Before Never we get again. To, before we get to like the <laughs> the later part of this podcast, I want to talk about L- Dr. Lilith Ritter for sure. Because yeah. what the hell? <laughs> I thought that she was really interesting. And then things just kind of went downhill. Yeah, let's yeah. start at the top of the hill. Okay. Man, I wrote down, Kate Blanchett has powers. Yeah. She is so good so and compelling. Yeah, yeah. She can just say things like a like a three word line, and I was just thinking, even if you had her voice, like, can anyone just go and look in the mirror and deliver that line a hundred times and ever get that close to no. what she can do? She it's she insane. did such a like she's so she can be so mysterious when she wants to be. Like I, I was like, this is like Galadriel in the 1940s, because because some of the ways that she, some yeah. of the like she, it's a similar um, tone that she's using where she's like, "Hello, Stan." Like and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Galadriel's like, "You will encounter great trials." Blah, blah. You know, it's like it's that same kind of like sure. ethereal, abstract sort of way of like kind of just like reaching into the the primitive part of your brain and just be like, "Well, I'm listening to you because you sound deep." It was so weird to see her in up. Or don't look up. Yeah. Mm, yeah. It's silly. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, complete opposite ends of the performance spectrum. Also, how heckin' old is she? Because I thought she was 50 in Fellowship of the Ring. And she's, she's still... She's 50. She's 52. Yeah. So she was only 30 when she was Galadriel. Wow. Crazy. She's, she's got timeless beauty. She's got them cheekbones. She's just... She's like... She's an elf. She's ancient, but <laughs> ageless. I think I think when she's given her best material, she is magnetic, as, as per usual. I think... Guillermo's not really an actor's director. He's like more about the craft and the visuals. And so I think that everyone in this movie isn't at their best. Mm. Like they're all pretty good and they're all committed. Right. But I feel like there's just like those little moments of like, was that really the best take you had? <laughs> and her especially, man, and her meltdown when she's like betraying Bradley Cooper, that whole scene, I'm like, this is really what you're going with? I had no idea why she was doing it. Yeah, yeah. I it's like talk the big that. twist. Oh, you got betrayed by her. But it's like, what does she want? Yeah, her motives aren't clear. Like the best thing I can come up with is that she had to do that to feel morally okay oh. because the blood of the judge is on her hands. The murder suicide. There, she mm. did this quid pro quo, which ultimately led to that murder suicide. Yeah. So maybe to make her self feel moral, she has to close the book and be like, I shot him mm. and I, yeah. I took him down. Uh, I think there. Is- I was doing this all to take him down. Yeah. A- after. Go ahead. Or I think like there is a reading of it that you could. I think the movie fails to communicate that. For yeah. sure. I think I think after the fact I became I'm I'm convinced that the reason that she turned on him was because of the initial humiliation. Like he made her feel like shit and he uh he like did a power play on her, right? And she saw that he was a con man and then she's like, "Okay, wait. You think that you're hot shit and you can control me, but you're just like you're 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 a, you're a fraud. She's actually a psychologist, you know. Mm-hmm. She actually has uh, which legit- Riley values. <laughs> Riley has a psych I love degree, psychology. Um, yeah, she's like, I actually have something going on, and I have a, le- yeah. a legitimate business or whatever. Yeah, what is in this office? Exactly. Sit down. I have a Lay secret. Down. I have a cool mm-hmm. mechanical setup where I press a button and like the thing pops out of the wall and records people. That's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I think I think that was the reasoning that she was like, and that's why her line, you know. Do, do am I powerful now, Stan, yeah. or do I look powerful or whatever? Because he says you hold this pistol or whatever. You like have power. You you you're a psychologist. You you try to have power over here over people, but you're not powerful. And yeah. then she's like, "I am I powerful now?" It's like her giant her revenge on him for humiliating her. But as you said, that's not really communicated in the movie. And while it was happening, I was like, "What the and fuck?" And it feels super like cheap because she stole character. the money yeah, because it's not earned. Yeah, it's not earned. There needed to be some kind of shot where. She gives a side eye or something, or we like suspect her. Yeah, and obviously, like there's there's like a tone throughout all of their interactions of like kind of like, ooh, Can't trust her. Yeah, we don't really trust each other fully. Are but they that's, gonna bang? But that's also just like the gen, that's the regular tone of the movie of everyone just kind of being mysterious and being like, oh, what's going on? And so it's like, if that was supposed to be conveyed in their conversations, it just wasn't. Why and then it comes off as so hokey? Didn't you see how heavy my clutch is? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, what is happening? Yeah. yeah. Why yeah. did hokey is a good word for? Yeah. That. Why did she shoot his ear? Is that to, is think. that symbolic? I was trying to figure that out. I don't know. Or it might be. Was in she this trying movie. to kill him? Yeah, or, I think I she was trying to shoot him in the head. 
but she's, she's not woman, powerful enough. She, oh, she's a woman and she can't shoot straight. Well, oh. those little short-barreled pistols are yeah, just they're hard. Unruly. Nickel plated ivory handle. You need the, pop, <laughs> the slippery popper. But then why doesn't she shoot him again? She has multiple bullets. She thinks she got him. He he collapsed. Or maybe she got him sufficiently for her recording, because she oh. then shoots into the air a couple times too. Does she? When they struggle. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I don't know. It's, it, it could be that she shot him on purpose. That's entirely possible. I thought that she just missed. Maybe. Because he, like, he goes, ah, and I, I, thought, I thought she full on shot him yeah. and that he was dead at that point. I thought he got it in the head, but it was just a tiny bullet. <laughs> and it was going to be like Godfather where you could still make faces. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, so she was ultimately disappointing, I feel like. Yep. Um, but, you uh, like Ron Perlman, hey? I didn't like his performance. I thought he was just kind of like. Oh, not that he was I just, loved him. He was just, just Ron Perlman. He's a side yeah, character. Hey, you better watch yourself, buddy, or I'm going to give you these five yeah. right here. You really Molly. big fists. Yeah. <laughs> really big. I was hired because of my big fists. Um, <laughs> Richard Jenkins as Ezra Grindle. Who's Unre- that guy? Unrecognizable. He's the, guy from, he's the dad are. from Step Brothers. Oh, it's that dude. This guy, Richard Jenkins. He's a real actor. There he is. I'm looking at him. I, I, like, I, I think I saw him. But, like, the character is introduced, and I was like, who is that character? Because I was like, I don't think that they would cast this role and not make it like sort of a recognizable character. But I didn't recognize him at all. You mean actor? But no, but he's a he's a Guillermo uh, actor, like yeah. staple now because he's in Shape of Water. Oh, is like, he? The neighbor. I haven't architect. seen Shape of Water. So. You watch it. Uh, eh. <laughs> I think you'll you'll like it. I probably won't. Um, just to be honest, Michael Shannon in that movie. I don't like so fish. Stereotypical. I don't think one-dimensional so. villain. Michael Shannon. This isn't a. I love Michael yeah, yeah. Shannon. Anyways, Richard Jenkins, the makeup and the beard and stuff were just like he com- he's completely unrecognizable, and I thought he did a good performance as well. I was like scared of him when he got angry. I was like, ah. I didn't really get what was happening at the beginning with the uh, the polygraph. I was like, wait, what? What are they doing? I th- they thought he was like the police coming after him or something. Oh I don't know. no, I he was really just he was just a wealthy man with resources, so he well, had this, that was like, awesome actually because that really raised the stakes of like, okay, here's your next target. Right. And mm. yeah, this guy's not going to be easy. Yeah. Pull out the polygraph. It was yeah. a competency test. And then I like how Can he can get past the polygraph. And, and he, he, gets, he does because they're well, he catching him on his lies and then he focuses away from facts and just like yeah. delves into the emotionalism of it. Yeah. Like that. That was a good was a good play. You like that? Hit pick. Uh, oh, wait. Is it? We have to do the thing. Play, play the stinger. Bam. Nit picks. I hit pick is Guillermo del Toro's obsession with uh, smashing in noses in movies. Oh yeah, uh, he does the almost the exact same makeup in uh, Pan's Labyrinth as Ezra Jenkins. You just left with like a bloody triangle. Oh yeah, it's like he in in uh, Pan's Labyrinth he takes a bottle, smashes a guy's face in a bunch of times. Oh and yeah, and it's like almost the exact same death. I was like, interesting. I wonder if it's a callback or if he just loves that death. Probably just loves it. Uh, we it's- should do Pan's Labyrinth. Sure, I love that movie. I love that movie. Oh, I, I mean, I watched it as a long time ago. I High school, know. for sure. Probably. Um, hit pick? When he's leaving Kate Blanchett's office, and he, like, first it's a hit pick, when he, like, kind of, like, rubs against the wall and leaves these blood trails, but the nit pick is the third time he touches the wall, and he, like, goes out of his way to, like, drag his hand on the wall so it leaves <laughs> a bloody handprint. It's like, okay, yeah, you wanted the shot, <laughs> but, like, you have to make it look like he's, like, struggling. It was yeah. so bad. But it's yeah. also like a Chekhov's gun that never goes off. Nothing yeah. ever happens with that bloody handprint. Good point. He's never ID'd based on it or something. That's it's a just a visual. It it's just like, yeah. a, oh, it's uh, leaving a trail of chaos behind him because of his mis- mistakes. Yeah, it could be that. Like it could uh, be. A, I don't know. It could be a visual <laughs> that represents his downfall. Like bloody. Mm. Now you have the bloody hand, not just Molly. Yes. Uh, here's a hit pick. I like how when he's he gets a, a letter from Molly, right? Mm. Uh but you hear the voiceover of the letter being read before he actually opens the letter. You actually, you hear the letter being read while he's still like having a cigar and sitting down and stuff mm. because the letter is only a few lines long, but if he had opened the letter and then she reads it along, we would just be sitting here watching him read it for like a full, yep. you know, 30 seconds and it would be weird. So that was just a really nice edit. In fact, that's, I have another hit pick that's an edit. Oh. The, uh, there's like almost a match frame cut between bathroom door unlocking and then the garden gate being locked. Oh, it's when yeah. he, he like follows Molly or somebody into yeah Molly into the bathroom and then she, he convinces her to come out of the bathroom stall. She unlocks that door and then it cuts to he's at the garden gate locking oh, it. So yeah. the scheme is mm. happening. So that was that was great. That's editing. That's editing, baby. <clears throat> um, I have a uh, he's so like is it, this is a hit pick I guess. Um, for Stan, the reason you like 
the reason he's doing all this is for money, I guess? Um, I think power. Well, they too. say, Peter says, a health, wealth, and something else. Pussy. <laughs> 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 he says, "Like, yeah, get get them where they. What, H- what matters H- to people? HWP. That's all you need. <laughs> what matters to people? Health, wealth, and pussy. So, um, right. health, wealth, family. I forget what it was, but it's, right. it's or health, wealth, power. Yeah. I don't know. It's, I thought it was. Uh, anyways, I, b- part of the reason is money for sure. Uh, and I thought it was like a good line when he's talking to Ezra Grendel at the end, and he's uh, well, sort of at the end. He's like, Grendel says, "I have more money than I'll ever need, but I don't have hope." And Stan says to him, and you think you can buy that? Which is funny because it's like, that's what he's been trying to do, you know, kind of like get enough money to buy happiness or whatever. And then Grendel says, I know I can. And then he laughs and like walks away. And it's it's like a, it's like a, uh, what do you call that? Foreshadowing sort of? Really short foreshadowing of like what's about to happen where like it's, it's, it's showing that prioritizing the wrong things is going to lead you into like a, uh, despair health wealth and love sure so david was right yeah basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he's not doing this for love nitpick nitpick uh why does he have no backups he's a con man who trusts no one yet he like gives all his money to this one lady like there, he has no hidden cash Ritter? uh stan this stan gives it to lilith so, yeah like yeah. he has no backup nothing that he's like planned no like i, I found that hard to believe and kind of like frustrating where i'm like you're your con man, dude. Like you would, you don't trust anyone, right? So you would, you would have some preparations for things going. Yeah, like he could just get like a safety deposit box, or something, something. <laughs> something. <laughs> Pretty sure they had those yeah, in it, 1940. It wouldn't have been as good of an ending of a movie as like the quick downfall into becoming the geek, but uh, it frustrated me. Wait, they do have safety deposit boxes because he went and got out the wife's. But I think the at that point it would have been too dangerous to go and get it. Like the police would know where he was. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's a nitpick. Sure, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But I think that yeah, him leaving the money with Ritter is another one of these sort of like, okay, it makes sense to have that confrontation at the end, but I can see what you're doing. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. To put the alcohol side by side. This is also a nitpick, but maybe it's a bigger problem. I feel like the movie's main themes are like ambition and greed and like this generational cycle of right. like failure or like of trauma. I don't think they like blend them together super well. Mm. Like the dad is not at all related to ambition and greed. No. Uh, and like it, I found that weird. Like I thought they were gonna like at one point kind of connect the two dots. Right. And they don't really do that. Well, I think that like I guess in a general psychological sense they are connected because when you are abused or when you experience trauma, then you feel a need to like prove to people that you're not damaged and mm-hmm. prove to people that you can succeed. So then you like attempt to become extremely competent in things uh, because you were maybe believed as a as a child that you weren't competent. So I guess psychologically those those themes are linked in the movie, but but not explicitly, and they could yeah. have been tighter for because sure. I didn't feel like, I felt his downfall with alcohol didn't seem signaled enough for me. Mm. Uh, like the first half of the movie, I was like, like I knew his dad was an alcoholic or whatever, but I never really connected with me that like, he had struggled with it, and so the fact that like that the kid that Stan had, yeah, because oh. he just says never. It well, makes yeah. it sound like he's yeah. never had it. Yeah, I thought it was like oh, for like the last like fifteen years, like his whole life he's never had it or whatever. And then it's like a kiss with the smell of whiskey is enough to start his oh, downfall. Well, no, I think that I think that the idea is that um, he has an alcoholic personality or whatever, and be, because of his, th- his upbringing or whatever. So I think that him. I didn't catch the the kiss with the whiskey on the lips. I read that and I was like, "Oh, that happens." Okay, I guess that's part of it. And maybe I missed it, but like I definitely saw him. There's a very clear shot of him downing a thing of whiskey for the first time. Yep. And so I think and then like time passes. So I think that it's implied that like over time, over like a few weeks or something, he just like gets into heavy 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 drinking. And because of his personality and his background, like it's it's not a gradual thing. It's like he goes full on. Um that just reminded me of a better movie than this, which is <laughs> <laughs> I should have put in my when I was rattling off all those rags to riches to rag stories. Barry Lyndon, hell yeah! Oh, have you yeah. seen Barry Lyndon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a Kubrick. movie. I haven't seen it. Everyone says we should do it. It's you a sh- it's like a Kubrick movie nobody talks about. It's awesome. Yeah, it's so yeah. Long. I've I've heard that Quite it's long. like underrated. It's, it's dope. Cool. It's really cool. It's um, beautiful and wacky. We should do it. Wait. I got a nitpick. Go for it. Did you guys notice that like some there were some like floating camera shots that were like shaky? 
Like as I, I the the place I noticed it was in Lilith's office, and this I think was another thing that made me kind of feel like some of the production elements were a bit amateur. Where like they're having him and him and him and Ritter are talking in their office, and it's like a it's like a tense scene or whatever, and the camera is like floating a little bit to give it sort of this, this like ethereal vibe. But I saw shake in the framing, Interesting. like the camera was like shaking a little bit, and we would we would like get ever so closer to Kate Blanchett and then like back off and it did not seem intentional. And yeah, that's your internet's bad, dude. <laughs> no. It was hitching. No, it was definitely there and I was just kind of like, what? Nah, Anyways, I didn't see that. Well, that's a nitpick on the just the production I thought that side. I saw some ADR problems. I couldn't figure out if that was my internet. You know, some I watch this. I watch it on Plex. Sometimes on Plex, uh, there'll be a sync issue with the mouse. And, but I swear to God, it was like, okay, that person just finished talking the mouse still moving and then when it the cut to the next shot, their mouths were in sync again, so I thought it was huh. an, maybe an ADR thing. I didn't really know that. All right, it's probably my problem. Mm. You had a pick? Uh, you got a pick? Hit pick uh, went on March 27th. This wins no Oscars. Ah! <laughs> hope so. I nice. hope it doesn't win a single Oscar. You hope it doesn't win a single What's it's... it nominated for? Let's Best see. picture. <laughs> my fi- my Fuck fi- right off. My final nitpick is Willem Dafoe stealing Stan's eggs. Eggs? Eggs. When they're when he's t- when he's telling him the secret of uh, how to make a geek, he, as he's talking, oh, he goes and yeah. takes some of Stan's eggs from his plate, even though he has eggs on his that's plate. That's hilarious. Yeah, I mean that's that's thematically appropriate. All right, not a nitpick. I guess that's a hit pick. That's it. I liked it. I like it. So for the Academy Awards, it's nominated for best picture, best nope. cinematography, best Maybe. best production design, sure. best costume design. Oh God. And then it's got a bunch of uh, BAFTA and Screen yeah. Actors Guild. So I'm okay with America. the production design and costume design because like it does do a good job. I don't think it should win uh, in a year that right. Dune also came out. I think Dune should win those. Fair enough. You know, like I, I need to I need to be clear here that I recognize the quality aspects of the movie. But yeah, like I think I said, like oh god, when it was nominated for this thing because I don't like it, but I understand that there is like talent and skill and people work hard in these things, and it's like they're going for a certain look. And I think they achieved that look to a certain extent. Yeah, I just didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Oh, I'm excited to like watch more of the Oscar nominated movies because I don't really have like a front runner for best picture. Dune's nominated for a lot of the same ones. Totally. Um, I think Dune's better for those visual aspects. For sure. Uh, I hope that Dune wins those. We do hope to have more coverage of some Oscar movies like oh, yeah. the was it Power of the Dog? Power of the Dog. That one I think we're going to cover just right before. Yep. That episode will come out just days before the Oscars actually occur. Then I just have to watch Drive My Car and King. Nice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You can't watch King Richard. You're not an asshole. You'll be supporting assholes. What? What? What are you talking about? What's wrong about? with Will Smith? Who made? Did somebody make? Oh, well, because the movie was because someone he, got canceled. He's, he's cast in a good light, but he was actually a dick in real life. Oh, uh, was he? Oh, uh, I thought you told me about that. Oh, you'll find out. I'll find <laughs> out. You're gonna hate it. More like King Dick. <laughs> um, is it fan service time? Let's do fan service. <laughs> um, I have something, but you go, James. Okay, well, James Whale, who is a larger James than I am, he said <laughs> uh, of The Godfather, I get where you're coming from, Riley, but you must admit the cognitive dissonance is interesting to watch. So oh, these are just going to be about me. This per- Yeah. <laughs> this person was talking about, you know, Riley's problem last podcast was that he didn't like the movie because he can't watch the gangster characters because uh, he doesn't like uh, people who act like them and he can't watch them. Um, so this person says... Wait, what? what makes this particular set of mafia characters interesting is how they seem to effortlessly compartmentalize two wildly different worlds, being murderous scumbags one moment and then loving family types the next. Right. The fact that psychologically they don't find anything contradictory there is what makes them watchable. I would argue the opposite. <laughs> like, I think that I think that, that can be... I mean, this just comes back to my main point where it's like, yes, that cognitive dissonance is very interesting and I think that it can make for extremely compelling villains. I mean, that's what you want, right? You want villains who believe that uh, they're doing the right they, thing. Or, either they're doing the right thing or they just have like good reasons to do it or whatever. And so it's like, I completely agree with his analysis of the of the mafia characters. Yes, they're able to compartmentalize in this way. But my problem isn't that that is the, the, the case because I like that in certain characters. My problem is that the movie in framing them fails to make them seem like the bad guy. And I think that like, we can. I think that people take for granted when they've watched untold numbers of films. When you're a film person, you take for granted that uh, a lot of people, when they watch movies, they're not like 
they're not coming at this with like a cold analysis t- type of type of uh, frame of view. Like they're watching it because You're saying they should be spoon fed. No, that's a very filmy person th- thing to say. I'm just trying to like be concise here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't want to be spoon fed. They want to feel something emotionally because they relate to something in the movie. And when you when you show people characters that are horrible, and without some sort of like takeaway of like we don't worry, the filmmakers know that they're horrible. I think, yeah. To me, the I think that spoon feeding them, yeah, something. That, no, it, you're not. Oh my I god. I feel like the to me the that's, difference that's is, is that like, you're saying that people should walk out of the theater and be like, I get it. Instead of like a movie like The Godfather, you should be thinking about for like weeks. And I think like that's the strength of it is that you're like. I love these characters. They're so great. And the more you think about it, you're like, oh, these are awful people. And then, then you're kind of reckoning with these complex feelings that you have as an audience. But you think you think at the end of the movie, people shouldn't be sure whether they think that the person's an awful person or not? I think you're this allowed. This is just like the Joker. This is just <laughs> like, it is. I don't, think that, I don't think that it's a strength of the movie when people walk out of the movie not knowing who the good guys and the bad guys are. I think you, you do know, but you have. To a certain extent. Yeah, and I think, right. I think. We talked about yeah, this. Though. You're right. This was the Godfather right, episode. Movie. Go back and watch. Well, it I, again, I guess my my last comment about this is simply that, like, I know <laughs> about the cognitive dissonance. I just think that movies have a responsibility to put something forward. That uh... shove it up your blowhole, James Whale. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> How dare no, you? No, I love you, James Whale, and keep up your whaling things. That He's you a do. whaler. Yep. What do you? What did you write down for fan service? What do you got? Well, I had a very <laughs> kind of a similar comment because it's the one that you pinned. I thought it was informative. He pinned he pinned this comment to the top of the video on YouTube. It says, "What Riley is describing, he wants are Hayes Code era Hollywood films." This is from Joseph Scheidler. You can have mafia, but they need to go to jail or die. You can have adultery, but the adulterer has to die or lose everything. It wasn't not about not showing bad people, but they always had to lose. There are certainly great movies from that era, but it leaves out so many great stories if that needs to be what happens. That sounds exactly what you want. No. To me. It's not. Okay. So Tell this, us again. Well, I think the main issue that I took with this comment is that it's it's implying that I think that needs to happen. Like, I don't think a movie has to do anything. You can make any movie you want. It needs to happen for you to like it. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, this is what we're talking well, about. But, no, no, but like, <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm not saying that like movies are bad if I don't like them. I can, and, and this we is what- We understand I, that opinions exist, right? Right, but this is what we're trying to get across in this podcast. They're just movies. We come in here, I'm giving my, I'm giving this movie a 4.9 out of 10. If I was giving it an objective rating of its like quality, I wouldn't give it a 4.9. I'm, I'm saying that's my experience of the movie mm. because I have certain ideas about what movies are supposed to do. Uh, but I don't have ideas about what movies are required to do. That's the difference. Hayes Code is a legal requirement that they show the the characters, uh, uh, you know, uh, being confronted with the ramifications of their actions. Oh, that's, no, a, I, that's I, a legal thing. But I'd yeah. say, oh, I what, didn't understand that. I thought it was just an era of filmmaking. But I think you said the same thing in a different way, though. You said it has a res- movies have a responsibility to right. do that, and it's like, okay, you don't have the power to make laws, but you think that for a movie to be good, it has to. Live to that responsibility. You are right. a regular. But I also we think, make moral I also think, judgments beyond legal. But things, I think that right? you're like I do feel like the movie doesn't like glorify where Michael ends up. I think the movie does do a good job. This of is that. where you two disagree. Well, this is just yeah. This is what we talked about last yeah. time. I thought that it hundred percent does glorify it. And and if you're a smart person and you and you know that like oh mafia are actually bad, then you don't think about this and you're just kind of like oh it's a good movie about mafia people. But I'm looking at it as a, as a as in the in the context of society, this movie may do some harm if they because make, they don't spoon feed the audience. Well, and the reason I say this is because my friends make growing my point up for me. My friends growing up thought that these guys were cool. They wanted to yeah, be mafia children people. Are fucking stupid. Yeah. Who watches movies? Not just children. Well, lots, lots of children. This watch is like, movies. A, isn't it a rated R movie? Like it's for grown-ups. So like, yeah, but it's an old movie. Kids the don't older, watch rated R movies. The older yeah, but like, movie are you gets. supposed to make your R movies appeal? Like, like have a moral message for children? There are children, like, and who there are, are you? Good are you like a Christian house mother in there, the seventies? There are children, and there are also adults with children brains. And I think that I there think is a responsibility to have movies that uh, improve society. Hence the Hayes Code. <laughs> Guys, now every movie must there's have a this. difference between moral responsibility and moral judgments that we can make about other people and legal proceedings that we can take right, against them. Right, but if you're saying that you know someone makes a rated R movie, they're 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 expecting their audience to have a certain understanding, 
But then you're saying, well, just anybody can watch the movie. It's not like it's illegal for a kid to watch a rated R movie. The solution to that would be something like the Hayes Code, where it's like, well, now no, the, there is no solution. There's the no sol- solution. There is this. The is solution, solution is the solution is our podcast and me saying that was kind of shitty of you to make people think that mafia are cool. All right, <laughs> that's the solution. Come back next week <laughs> for the Batman. Ooh. I don't know if this movie is going to be cerebral or stupid or I awesome. Heard, I heard the closest comparison is Zodiac. Mm. Don't get my hopes up. That's crazy. I heard things about as well along what? those lines. This movie's gonna be two hours and forty minutes. It's two and a half hours. Yeah. It, it, ew! Every <laughs> movie is two hours and, <laughs> and a half. <laughs> oh, one last thing about that because this movie is a tragedy. He does bad things. The movie shows him the ramifications of that happening. Yeah. And so, well, this movie's like a fable. Yes. This movie's. But well, you're, that's I mean, what movies are fables. Like. Yeah. Not all of them. Should be. Then yeah. you need to just watch Godfather two and three. Yes, Let's do it. Right, and I acknowledge that people are saying that it's yeah. that my concerns are addressed. Like if you want Godfather two, subscribe. If you want the Batman, well, we're doing the Batman next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. Still subscribe. Subscribe, anyways. You can tweet at us if you want your comments to end up in this show. Very maybe you can tweet at us at TGM Pod. You can reply on YouTube. You can also email us hello at they're just movies. Bad stuff. Yeah, rate us, rate us five stars in a funny way. Watch our show in the milk shed, <laughs> or wherever you want. Okay, bye bye.